everybody. I am Bob Goodwin, president and founder of Career Club, and welcome to another episode of Career Club Live. I'm so glad that you've taken a moment to join us. If you are watching this on YouTube, please subscribe and comment and like. It really does help. And if you're downloading this on your favorite podcast platform, uh, review, subscribe, rate. It really does help. Um, and if you're a first time watcher or listener, uh, we'd encourage you to also check out career.com club that's our website where we're helping people like you find a career that matters to them we've got tons of free resources available to help you do networking better answer tough interview questions and how to identify opportunities that maybe you didn't know were available so again you can find all of that at career.club so uh, today's guest is, i'm very very excited about um, he's a former naval officer my Dad went to the Naval Academy, so, and then my older brother was also on a nuclear sub. So our, our guest today is Mark Kohler. And Mark is a former Naval officer and uh, on a nuclear submarine. We're gonna talk about that some. But um, he's also a best-selling author and 35 plus years sought after elite leadership expert and founder of the leadership development and research firm, Lead With Purpose. He's also the author of a book, called Lead With Purpose, which we're going to dive into quite a bit. And without further ado, Mark, welcome. Oh, Bob, thank you so much for, for having me on the podcast. Uh, I'm humbled and I'm excited to be here. No, I, we're, we're humbled to have you. I, first of all, thank you for your service to the country. I'm always appreciative of our veterans, so thank you for that. Oh, thank you. No. So, um, as is our want to do, uh, and we'll, we'll be brief about this, but just uh, we like to help people get to know you a little bit as just a person. Sure. So uh, very quickly, where were you born and raised? Yeah, born in Rochester, New York, raised there. Um, my mom and dad had a hairdressing shop off the end of our house. So I, I grew up in an entrepreneurial um, uh, family and I and, uh, had some you know, great upbringing there. I was in a bunch of cornfields all around us. We had 70 mm -hmm. people in our town. So just a, yeah. So from Rochester, New York. And, and where, where do we find you today? Where do you live now? Now I live in San Diego. And the reason I was in San Diego, I'm in San Diego still is because I got stationed out here and my mom and dad said, Hey, when you coming back? And I said, I don't think ever. Apparently y'all have <laughs> never been to San Diego. <laughs> yeah. Back. Yeah. So, so yes. No, that's awesome. Um, and just a, you, you mentioned your mom and dad, but also your your nuclear family, a little bit about your family there in San Diego. Yeah, so uh, I've been married to my wife, Heidi, for 29 years. And uh, we live in Oceanside, California, which mm -hmm. is uh, north, northern California. And then um, I've raised, with my wife, uh, I've raised uh, three daughters. They're 26, 24, and 22, and they're, they're killing it in life. Um, we're excited about them. And I also have a female dog, a husky that I'm dealing with. So I'm dealing with five different women. So <laughs> I'm not going to touch them. I'll let that one just sit. Um, yes. So where did you go to college, Mark? Yeah, so uh, I went to college um, at State University of New York in Fredonia. And um, what's interesting is I went there for physics. Uh, in 1986, a little known movie came out. The movie was Top Gun. Mm. And in the first four days of the uh, movie being released, I saw it four times. And it encouraged me to go into the recruiting office in Buffalo, New York at the time to be a jet fighter pilot. And what I can share with you is that I went through all the tests that day. And at the end of the day, the recruiter comes out and says, hey, you passed every test, but we have to have you take one test over. And I said, well, what is it? He said, currently your thigh bone is three eighths of an inch too long to sit in a jet. And so we retook the test. I got it to within an eighth of an inch, and but I got disqualified from being a, a jet fighter. How tall are you, Mark? Um, I'm six foot five. So, um, you know, it isn't the total height. It's the component parts. And just so my, my thigh bone is is uh, is pretty long. So, But uh, the, the recruiter, I mean, probably one of the best salespersons I've ever um, been connected with. Because as I was leaving the recruiting station, he's like, what about flying helicopters? I mean, he, he must have needed another recruit. And, and then he said, hey, what, what about what about the submarine force? And and that really started my journey into the nuclear submarine force. Well, I, I don't know how good of a sales or how desperate he was. I'm sure he's a good salesperson, but I think he also recognized quality and talent when it walked into his office. Um, oh, because this is uh, going to be a lot of what we talk about is your career. But just uh, do you mind just 
kind of very briefly painting a quick picture of, of life after college and all the way to now? Yeah. Yeah. So I went to, uh, then I, I, I did the first three years there. I went two years at Clarkson University at a mechanical engineering degree. I went through the entire pipeline of the U.S. Nuclear Submarine Force. What's interesting is that you don't see a submarine for the first two years. We were on <laughs> land the entire time. And so the onboarding process was a two-year process. And um, so I got stationed out in, in San Diego in 1990. And um, at that time, I was uh, 24 years old, helping a 110 men drive a billion dollar submarine around on missions critical to national security. Fantastic experience um, as a young person, really forged who I am today. Um, one of the things I didn't really love about it is we were out at sea over 85% of the year. And so that environment that I grew up in with my mom and dad being home um, and running a hairdressing business off the end of our shop, I, I just couldn't see myself um, missing the birth of my child and all of those mm -hmm. things. So I got out, I took a quick stop at Honeywell what I loved about Honeywell was the professional training that I got, how to read a profit and loss statement, put together big company strategic plans. What I didn't love about Honeywell was it was a big 32,000 person, a lot of hierarchy, red tape, took forever to make a decision. Sounds like the military so, to me, but keep going. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it, it's interesting. It, it, um, you know, in the submarine force, we have a ton of structure, but we also um, have a ton of agility. Yeah. To be able we're going to, to talk. We're going to talk about that agility, man. I interrupted you. Continue. Go ahead. So after Honeywell, yeah, went yeah. yeah, no worries. So in 2005, when my kids were eight, six, and four, I could either climb Honeywell's corporate ladder, or I could be at every back to school in my core performance soccer practice. I chose the latter of the two, and I started doing strategic management consulting. And, and Bob, I fell into doing turnaround work. Hmm. So I'd come in as the interim turnaround CEO for a company that had lost its way. Typically, the companies had six to nine months of cash. Uh, they were going through some type of disruption, transitioning from Johnny Sr. to Johnny Jr. Uh, they had maybe their products were being made in the United States. Now they're being knocked off in China. Um, for me, it was fantastic because it was some type of puzzle to try to figure out. And what I can share with you is this took over two decades to, to really develop. But I initially tried to apply the skills and tools that I learned at Honeywell to these businesses. And frankly, I think I was aware enough to know that I was almost killing them. And so I had to scrap those tools, go back to my time in the submarine force and really analyze how do we get 130 you know, men, um, average age 23 years old, to operate a billion dollar submarine on missions critical to national security, life and death situations. And so when I took a look at that, it was, uh, it was very revealing for me. And so I, I just took a bunch of the tools that I learned from the submarine force, started applying them to the turnarounds I was, and I was able to take uh, teams that were failing before, I was able to take and, and turn their attitude around about what's most important and how they connect to something bigger than themselves. And that's why the company is called Lead With Purpose, because if we can show people how what they do connects to making a difference in the world, then we can have a tremendous impact. And what I would just end with is, we created an entire framework. It's called Fast Attack Leadership. And it's the five-step framework that U.S. nuclear submarine officers use on top secret missions that anyone can learn so that they can create and sustain fully aligned, highly adaptable, world-class teams that execute at the highest level. We are going to break that down because that's exactly what I'm hoping that we can talk about. Very quickly, yeah. when you're not doing all that and speaking and writing and doing podcast interviews and stuff. But what do you do for in your spare time? What do you do for fun? Yeah, you know, Heidi and I, my wife, Heidi and I, uh, we went empty nest a year ago. And so um, and, we, and everyone's off the payroll. So <laughs> so it's interesting. We're, we're really getting to, you know, reengage with each other. And because there's always this, you know, there's three kids and you're off at soccer practice, you're off at volleyball practice. And, and so we're, we're reconnecting with each other and it's been, it's been fantastic. We love going for walks on the beach. We live about four miles away from the, from the Pacific ocean. Um, there's so much that, um, that I had um, in the Pacific ocean that I just, I just get a lot out of and, and we get a lot out of And downtown Oceanside has been transformed over the past five years to be a world-class um, uh, city and and the new um, restaurants and all the stuff that they have. And Bob, when you're in town or anyone's in town, you look me up, I'll take you down to Craft Coast Tacos and Beers. And oh, you, you sold. After, we'll go to Tory Pines and then we'll go do that. So that sounds like fun. Yeah. So, um, so, so let's just, you know, kind of get into it. Um, 
lead with purpose. And you and I have gotten to know each other, you know, here recently. And, and purpose is something that's very uh, resonates with both of us. C- can you talk about purpose and in, in, in why it matters and in, in why it especially matters when you're leading? So my experience in, in the submarine force, uh, it really taught me a, a lot about the power of the mission, the power of purpose. And only when I was able to really reflect upon it, when I was having this challenge as a turnaround CEO, was I able to clearly pull back the layers and see um, how important it is. And that's why I, I called the company Lead With Purpose. So the U.S. Nuclear Submarine Force has had to rely upon for the last 123 years, very young people and people from all over the United States. So we didn't, you know, when we were on the submarine, we didn't get to choose the person who showed up to the submarine. So the person who showed up to the submarine, they were going to become part of the team. And whether you were born in South Carolina or state of Washington, whether you had this political belief or that political belief, whether you had this ethnicity or you had this, didn't matter. And, And so what we had to do is I saw the power of the mission I saw the power of the mission be able to meld all of that together because that's what it really became about. It became about, you know, whether you'd been on board the submarine for three days, or whether you'd been on board the submarine for three years, could you, when you're walking in machinery to upper level and water's flowing in at the speed of a bullet would cut you in half, are you going to be able to step in, step up, and are you going to be able to be a leader in that situation? That's all we cared about. And it created this tremendous bonds of trust of like, Bob, I need to count on you and and you need to count on me. And it was all about the simplicity of the mission. I can just share with you one other thing, the submarine motto. I'd forgotten about it. But when I was doing this analysis, the submarine motto is either we all come to the surface or no one does. Think about that. And so when we think about World War II, the culture of the World War II submarines, 50% of the submarines were lost at sea. Now, can you imagine going, saying, hey, wow. hey, honey? <laughs> yeah. And, and so it was this cult, this, this tremendous culture that I was, I was enveloped in. One other thing to, to make people aware of, on an operating submarine, which is out at sea over 85% of the year, the entire crew turns over every three years. Really? There's people always rotating in and rotating out. So oh, we wow. talk about like retention and turnover. So so how do you, how do you make that happen? And, and people come to the submarine, not qualified to run the reactor, not qualified to drive the submarine. You have to train them, and then they leave, and then you get someone new, and you have to do it over again. And so so when I when I really looked at this. Bob and I was I was evaluating and, and going, hey, why aren't these tools from Honeywell working? When I really looked at it, I was like, what caught, what helped us to be successful? At the core of it was mission. Mm. Now I'm just going to share one other thing. Is when I when I looked at the tools that helped to really make sure everybody understood the mission. One of the tools we had is we had basically a one page captain's orders. Now at the top of the captain's orders was was our mission, what we were going to do. And then down below was everyone's role in making it come true of the different departments. So this was a fantastic document because anybody could look at it and say, hey, what's our mission? And then what's my role? And then what's my role in the context of everyone else? Yes. And I was like, I was like, that is a great tool. And so, you know, when I'd gone into this first turnaround, I took the team off site for four days. We created this 32 page plan and a binder. We were all excited about it. I was, you know, and, and someone in the, in the meeting finally says to me, hey, I don't know how this is helping me to run the business. And it was a huge awakening for me. And, and I just went back and we created one page captain's plans. And that's where I was able to show people how what they did connected to making a difference in the world. And, and the Gallup employee engagement statistics were huge in helping me to define that because back then they're almost the same as they are today. 70% of people don't understand how what they do today connects to making a difference in the world. And guess what? 70% of people are not living the best version of themselves, not fully engaged in their job. And I believe it had to do with 
with the complexity of the mission statements that we used to have that were 42 words long, bunch mm -hmm. of commas in it, one run long on sentence. No one could repeat it. And so, you know, for for people who are listening right now, if you want to know whether your mission statement's resonating, go down to the person who just showed up three months ago, ask them, hey, what's our mission statement? And if they can't state it, I think it's the communications tool. And, and the submarine force taught me make things simple and make things very clear. And so purpose, I, I found getting a great purpose statement, great mission statement, that's basically a code word and an image is what helped people to realize, hey, what I am doing is making a difference in the world. And that's what I saw forming on land when I was doing these turnarounds. So quick mission, question, Mark. Quick question. Yeah. So on a submarine, national defense, life or death, like I can get around the mission statement pretty easily, right? I mean, like I, I know why we're here. And oh, by the way, I joined the army or the army, I joined the Navy because I wanted to, right? Because it right. wasn't conscription. So let's say, okay, that's cool. I get it in that context, but I'm taking over a failing aluminum siding business, right? That's got six to nine months worth of cash left. How do, yeah. how do you get people rallied around and find purpose in that that seems so much less important, potentially? It's a great question. What I, I'm going to just flip it. I'm going to say a failing wire manufacturing company. Okay. I'm, I made of yeah. aluminum siding. That's the most random thing I can think of. I did an aluminum siding one too, but I'm, I'm going to share with you the, the, the wire manufacturing. Sure. So um, I go into this wire manufacturing company. The company is manufacturing wire um, that's very specific to the application. So they are manufacturing wire that goes on the space shuttle, um, that goes in medical mm -hmm. devices. They're not, this isn't wire you buy at Home Depot or Lowe's. No. And so very specific applications. When I go in, I look at the P&L and it shows that 18% of the wire is being returned by the customer. Doesn't meet the specification. 18%? 18%. And wow. they're wondering why they're failing. They're wondering why they're failing. And so when, when I when I go into this company, I start really taking a look at the history of the company. Now, um, initially started in the 1960s by the father. The father um, had created a machine that was the first machine that could put a stripe on a on a hula hoop. Now, for those of you who don't know, a hula hoop didn't use to have a, didn't have a stripe on it initially. And so people would look 100 yards across the field. They just see a person like like move, doing this motion. Like, what are they doing? When they put a stripe on it, that's when the hula hoop took off because people could see it. And they're like, oh, they're having fun. And so we, we had this company that had this tremendous legacy of, of bringing these great products to life. When there was a, a wine cork um, problem, they were the first one to, build, to, to create an artificial wine cork. In the 1980s when there's so I had this tremendous legacy when i walked in and and i saw what was up on their boards they had all the hr stuff which is important the pay and all that stuff and i was like where's the legacy of the company and so worked with the leadership team and we and we came up with a brand purpose um and and the brand purpose was really simple is improving lives that was it went through this entire exercise improving lives we got that out to the leadership team but one of the things that it wasn't getting out to, it wasn't getting out to the manufacturing floor. And so on the manufacturing floor, I started taking a look at and analyzing what was going on on that floor. And what I found was that they didn't have a process that they were following, a common process. Now I'm a master black belt in Lean Six Sigma. I'm like, let's create a process. We're going to have the, the head of manufacturing. We're going to have the leaders of the manufacturing plant. We're going to create a process. We create this great nine-step process, Bob. Great nine-step process. It's perfect. And after about two months, we see returns drop from 18% down to 16%. Now I have to tell you, I'm sitting there in the manufacturing plant, arms crossed, and I'm just like, what is going on? I know the manu I know the process is, is correct. And as I'm sitting there, I just notice one of the machines, there's eight machines in the plant. These are big machines that are, are spanning wire across about 20 feet. And I look over and, and there's the operator doing a bunch of stuff, but I don't see the wire. And so I go over to the operator and I say, hey, um, what, that wire is really thin. Like, where is that going? And the, and the operator goes, I don't know. I call Armando over. Armando, where is that wire going? He takes a look at the box and he's like, 
That wire's going to Tarumo Heart. That's going in a pacemaker. You know what the operator said? The operator said, oh. <laughs> wow. And in that moment, I think I had enough understanding that I could see the, the, the shift in the mindset shift in that operator. And so because the nine step process wasn't working, I went over to the next machine. I go, hey, where's that wire going? You know what the operator says? Oh. I don't know. <laughs> Eight wires being coaxed together. Armando, where's that going? That's going in the deep submergence vehicle. That's going to go down to the Marianas Trench. Guess what that operator said? Oh, that's cool. <laughs> went around to every single one of them. None of them knew where the wire was going. So this is this is I was doing a turnaround. The next day I came in, I went around to all eight machines again. Four of them knew where the wire was going. Four of them. Four of them didn't. The next day, guess what? All eight of them, the wire that they were manufacturing, they knew where it was going. Mm -hmm. And I did that every day for the next two months. Returns dropped from 16% to 3%. Because what I was able to do is I was able to connect the wire for people. Mm -hmm. I was able to take a piece of wire and turn it into a story of how it impacts another human being. And so you can do this with any, any process. You can keep saying, where, where does it go? Find it all the way to then. Aluminum siding, you can do the same exact thing. But telling stories, we, we're, we're naturally built to tell stories. Humans are storytelling machines. Yes. And when we put it in that aspect, um, that's what happens. Now, there's one step that I changed in the nine step process. It's the first step and it turned it into a 10 step process. So I made the process longer, but can you guess what the first step was before the operator started doing anything on manufacturing wire? What was the first step? Find out where's this going? Where? Who's this it's for? That. It's that simple. And so I would encourage people, make sure that, you know, improving lives was really important. But then you, if you can attach stories to it, and you can do this with any, any product, any service, any component, take it to where it impacts a human being. So that's awesome. I, I really, really appreciate how you're helping people at Career Club. You know, we're helping people. That are, our mission is helping people find a career that matters to them. So finding something where they find purpose, where they can find meaning. And that can be different for everybody, right? Yes. But, but you know, that's just such a, it's such a great thing of just kind of keep plumbing and keep double clicking on, but where ultimately does this impact another human? How does this make another person's life better, improving lives? That, that you can find the purpose if you're looking for it. I want to move to the other key word in, in the book's title, uh, which is leading. So this is a little bit of a trick question, which you'll smile is, so is this only for people that have like a leadership title? Is that, is that the only people that this would apply to? Yeah, no, the, the leadership mindset, the mindset shift that all people need to take uh, in a company, and it's what we had in the submarine force, and it's what I had and what helped to, to do the turnarounds is the mindset shift that all leaders need to have is that every person, every employee in your company, you have to consider them a leader. You have to tell them that and, and they have to expect that they are a leader, whether they've been there for three days or whether they've been there for 30 years. And so it's not about a title and a role. If you have 5,000 people at your company and you have 10 people on the top leadership team, there's not 10 leaders in your company. You have to think about that you have 5,000 leaders in your company. And when you, when you make that shift, because I know you do this too, when you make that shift, it, it sets up to say, hey, how am I going to get that person to be a leader? And then you start looking at personal development plans and, and all of these different things. So yes, leadership is everybody at the company. Can you share with people the example that you shared with me in a previous uh, conversation we were having about rotating meeting responsibilities and who's running the meeting? Yeah. So if you want to make um, any of your meetings better, we have a certain agenda that we think is, is really great. But if you want to make any of your meetings better, just do this one thing. You can keep the same exact agenda. Just rotate the, the person who's leading the meeting. So, Bob, if we're having a meeting and every single time it's your meeting, I am coming to your meeting. And what you do is when you do this simple act of rotating the meeting leader, 
is the next time it becomes it becomes the meeting the way I want to run it. And what happens is it starts building these bonds of trust between each other, because when you're running the meeting, you know, I, I want to make you look really good because the next time I run the meeting, I want you to reciprocate back. Yes. So so that 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 happens. The other thing that we do is we teach people how to lead others, how to be a leader. But then it's just important is how do, how do we learn how to be a great follower? Oh, and my gosh. So now as you're happen- saying something that is near and dear to my heart. Go. Yeah. 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 So so it, it's we we um we talk about daily meetings and weekly meetings and we talk about the daily meeting rotating it um one of the one of the great things we got back from the company it has over 700 employees worldwide retail organization the senior vp of hr said hey you helped increase engagement across our entire company 6% and but what we really appreciate is that you helped move our deib program forward and and frankly we don't we don't position ourselves as a deib program but and I asked her why, and she said, because you give everyone, your program gives everyone the opportunity to have their voice heard. And we've seen the impact that that's made. And that's all submarine force. That's all from the submarine force. So, so, so I'm, I've been a terrible host. I interrupted you just in terms of teaching people how to be great followers. What do you mean by that? Well, I, I, think, um, I think when we talk about how we need to organized success. And, you know, we have the old traditional framework where we have hierarchy and we look at an organizational chart and we have people who are at the top who are, who are making decisions. And what you have to do is you have to shift to a matrix framework. So think about a matrix with a bunch of nodes on the outside and lines going between everyone. Mm-hmm. And when there's a challenge, what has to happen is you, not everyone needs to be in that meeting. So only the people who have the expertise really need to be in that meeting. Mm -hmm. And so say, for example, it's not about your title. If you're the CEO of the company, if there's someone in your company who has an expertise in a certain area, they actually lead the meeting and you are subservient to them. And you have to be the person who's asking them questions. Mm -hmm. What have you tried already? What are the things that you, um, have worked? What hasn't worked? Are there any resources that you need from me? So the ability to form and then unform teams, we call it a matrixed environment, the ability to be able to do that, you need to learn how to be a great um, follower. And a lot of leaders, their biggest challenge is like, hey, I should know every answer. I need to be at the top. And when you can release that and let that go, that you're just an organizer of talent, talent to solve that specific specific situation. Yeah, no, that's really, really good. And so um, and I think that this idea of like rotating the leadership of the meeting also creates empathy as when when you're, you know, not the leader in supporting the person who's trying to lead the meeting because you know what that feels like. Right. But you also in participation, engagement, you know, yes. in, in learning how to be a really good follower, like I would love to do just a completely separate episode because so much gets put on leading. Well, if you don't have followers, you're not leading. You're just out walking by yourself. And and so, you know, learning how to be a great follower, which does require you, you said subservient, but you know, it does require a level of humility. That, Humility. You know, I probably shouldn't use that word. Better well, well, no, I'm, I'm just saying, but, but like, I'm going to cede yeah. control. I'm going to actually cede my ego right now to, to allow you to use your gifts, your strengths. And, and I want to follow you rather than, like you say, somehow competing for power, which is a very unhealthy dynamic. Um, so I, I just really appreciate what you're sharing. Um, before I want to you, add one other. I want yeah, to add please. one other. One other thing here is uh, for people. You think about rotating the the meeting leader. You might be going, "Oh, geez, like how's that going to turn out?" People step up. They they love it. The other thing that you get from it, if I always run the meeting the way I run it, and I only have a certain set of skills and tools, we never get to see your skills and tools. So, like what I get out of it when other people run the meeting, I go like, "I love, I love how Bob handled that." I'm actually going to take that as part of my my toolkit. 
and you get this you you're actually doing leadership training when you're when you're doing that also so here's, I a, here's add a great that. quote for you that, that we uh, we got from a uh, previous podcast interview with the former CEO of Procter and Gamble, David Taylor. And mm -hmm. we were talking about this, you know, being the wizard in a meeting and you're the CEO of one of the largest, you know, public companies in the world with all these iconic right. brands. Like, how do you create that environment, you know, where people don't just like, oh gosh, that's a CEO. And it's just, for him, it was very simple. I just, one, I've, all I'm there to do is facilitate because this is such a great line. None of us is better than all of us. I love it. Isn't that great? Love it. None of us is better than all of us. And I can tell you, Mark, even since we've been, you know, interacting, um, you know, I've been did like this uh, meeting rotation thing. It's a brilliant idea. I mean, it's so implementable. It costs zero dollars. You can do it today. And and all the benefits that you're describing, we're already seeing, you know, uh, at Career Club. So it's very, very cool. I'm going to go ahead. I, I, I got to I got to add this. Our, our 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 phases are if you engage people and you open up their heart and show them how what they do connects to making a difference in the world, they're going to go above and beyond on their own. Then you're a lot, then you can push decision making down responsibly. And once you do that, then you can then you can encourage people. What happens, Bob, is what if you're always running the meeting, when you say, hey, I'm gonna give up control of the meeting, because I I I I think that you guys can run the meeting better, you know, better than I can. When you do that, you empower them, they go like, Wow, Bob, mm -hmm. trust me. Guess what that does? Yes. When you empower people, it re-engages them to want to do more and want to do better. So there's so many benefits. Like you said, simple, costs nothing to implement. No, I love it. So so in um, Fast Attack Leadership, there's a five-step framework. Um, I, I'd be like yep. completely remiss if you didn't share what those five steps were. Yeah. So it might be a surprise to you. Connect people to the mission is pillar number one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So connect them to the mission. Um, that that that's the most important thing. A lot of people say, "Hey, I've I've gotten my mission statement really uh, refined." And what you'll find is that people are either going to be really attracted to that, or they're not going to be attracted to it. And so, a lot of times, what it's done is help to have a conversation. Of I always say to people, "Hey, if you're not happy here, like eight to ten hours, twelve hours a day, let's find you a place where you can be really happy." So you get clarity around that. That's connecting the mission. The second is take the shot. How do we give people the skills, the tools in this dynamically changing, disruptive, constant world of flux? How do we give them a set of basic tools so, so that they can be successful? And we've talked about this before. How do they have agency? Yes. How do they have personal agency? So when something happens and there's an opportunity that's in front of them or a disruption, can they, can they take action on that? That's, that's one. If they can't take action on themselves, how do they get into this matrix team and go collective? How do we collectively then, then tap into that? So take the shot is a set of tools and skills that allows um, people uh, to be able to make decisions. Mm -hmm. So that's pillar number two is take the shot. Number three is empower jam dives. Jam dive is a, is a story that I, that I take people through, but anyways, empower people. What does the leader then need to do to responsibly push decision making down, and we are, we get asked this a lot. Hey, how do how do I do this? Um, you know, one of the biggest things if you have um, taught your kid how to ride a bike, if you've been taught how to how to you know drive a car, um, you start off very simple. You start off with really simple things. You don't put your kid on a ten speed on a downhill. They actually, you know, they have training <laughs> wheels. They're running behind, and and a lot of there's, there's a lot of confidence that comes in, in, in when people make decisions and then you say, hey, that was a great decision. So, so it's what the leader needs to do to responsibly um, empower people to make decisions at every layer of the organization. So that's number three. Number four is people are doing fantastic work and you have to define your Bravo Zulu. Bravo Zulu is a, a term in the Navy that means good job. Oh. And so it's about recognizing, recognizing your employees, everyone, says, oh, yeah, we have a recognition program. I say, what is it? Oh, we recognize people for being here for a year and three years. And yeah, you have, you have to be able to do that. 85% of, of employees 
They want a simple verbal recognition. And we're not doing a great job here. Simple verbal recognition, Bob, same thing as rotating the meeting leader, costs nothing, costs nothing. And 82% of employees today say they're not receiving enough recognition at work. So it's it's about defining your Bravo Zulu. And then the fifth thing is we call it steady as she goes. The leadership pieces that we teach are simple. They're easy to implement. They're powerful, not in that you did it once. They're powerful in that you're doing it consistently day after day after day. Mm. And so that's what I want to make sure people understand. We complicate leadership. And what I was taught in the submarine force was it's about the simple things done excellent, done on a daily basis that are going to help you to get the best results. So those are the five pillars of fast attack leadership. No, it, I mean, really, really powerful stuff. I love the fact that there's a focus on simplicity in this, that this isn't a seminar that we go to on one day and then we kind of forget it. And But it's right. simple things done with excellence consistently. And, and what, do, what do you find? See, that appeals to me, but I can also see where somebody would be going like, particularly if I'm running out of cash, like, dude, that all sounds great. I need a magic wand. Like I need, like, that sounds like building a forest and I ain't got time for a forest. How do yeah. you respond to somebody that's looking for a quick fix when that may not feel quick? It, it's, it's pretty quick. We have, a, we have an entire exercise people go through and, and it's really simple. Just start off with, if you get your purpose set first, just like the connect the wire story, we, mm -hmm. ha we had the best process in the world. I mean, world-class, again, I, I'm not trying to, you know, pat myself on the back, but I'm a, I'm a master black belt and lean six sigma. And the one thing that was missing was this, was this first piece. And a lot of people say, well, I got to go through four days off site and everything. You can, you can do this in 90 minutes. You can go through an exercise. And basically what you do is you put your products and services down at the bottom of what you offer. And you just keep asking why, why does that matter? Why does it matter to our clients? And you get all the way to the top, then do it with your employees. What are the things that employees get? They get paycheck, they get some benefits. Why is that important? Why is that important? And you'll find that there's a common message that's up there. I would share with you that um, I have a master, master's equivalent of a master's in nuclear engineering. So I'm not a marketing person, mm -hmm. but you can take what comes out of that and you can create a first code word and it's extremely powerful. So it doesn't take very long to do. I would not jump over that step and come back to it later because if you have 70% of your people not fully engaged, I mean, 50% are quiet quitting. You're not getting the best from them. Um, you can turn those pretty quickly. And Gallup has shown that you can turn those pretty quickly. And one of the key things you can do is show them how what they do connects to making a difference in the world that does not take very long to do. Yeah. So maybe that's a good opportunity to come back to something that you were saying a little while ago, which is let's get you somewhere where you can be happy somewhere. And that may be at a place, not at this address, right? Yes. So, you, you know, I think we talked about this in a previous conversation, but the difference between a skeptic and a cynic, a skeptic doesn't understand yet. They don't believe comma yet, but they're open to it. They just need more information, a little bit of soak time to get there. A cynic is like, I don't care what you say, I'm never going to believe. And it's the cynic that needs to go. The skeptic, ironically, can end up being your greatest advocate because they've had all the doubts. And they, they, they've had their, their doubts addressed. So when they meet somebody who's doubting, it's kind of the, I understand how you feel. In fact, I felt the same way. What I found was, and it's like, it's sympathetic and it's very effective. But a cynic is, you know, this is an overused word these days, but it's toxic to trying to drive change because you don't want to believe. Yeah, what I'll share with you in the in the turnarounds that I've done, and we've worked with over 500 companies also. What I found is when we go into organizations and we ask the CEO, hey, tell us about your mission statement. And they, they do this. They do this. They go, oh, let me get the binder, yep. right? Let me get the binder and let me read it to you. And I'm like, no, no, you can't have a binder. <laughs> and then when people say, then when people say, hey, yeah, it's really strong. And because it's up on the wall and they just read it off the wall, I go, hey, you want to go outside? Let's go. Let's go ask some people. We go ask some people and no one knows anything about it. And so I think it's really important when we go in, 
we find that there's a huge gray area. And a lot of people are stepping into that gray area when they want to, and they step out of it when they don't want to. Mm. And so what you do is you get really clear, hey, this is who we are. This is why we exist. And I, I would say with you, a lot of people go, oh, I didn't know that that wire did that or that aluminum siding did that or my law firm did that and how it impacted a person on the other side. What I can share with you, it's, it's very powerful, too, to drive that conversation where the person who is going to be the cynic, going to stay the cynic, guess what? They, they stick out even more. And it's not to have them stick out and have them be like, hey, you're a bad human being. Right. But it helps to have that conversation. I'll just share one, one story. It was a, a company that I was at, got really clear on the mission statement. One of the people was very ornery and, you know, it drove a conversation. And the woman's name was Lisa. And Lisa says, hey, I, I don't know. I don't feel, feel comfortable here. I said, well, what is it? She goes, I don't know. I just, the culture is, you know, it's not really who I am. And as, as you know, Bob, you know, we talked about if your personal values don't align with the, the company values, there can, be some, there can be a lot of strain. So I said, well, what do you want to do? She said, I think I want to look for another opportunity. What I did is I said, okay, fantastic. I'm going to help you. Guess what? Every person is watching you as you're, as you're helping this person and serving this person. So she went off to another job and literally two years later, she calls me. She's on the phone. It's Lisa. And I'm sitting there going like, oh my gosh, is she on the street? Yeah. Like, what's happening? Answer the phone. Hey, Lisa, what, what's going on? And she goes, hey, I just want to, I just want to thank you. And I said, well, well, how's things going? What's going on? She goes, you know what? I'd stopped off at this other job, but uh, in the back of my mind was still the, the conversation that we were having. And she goes, right now I'm, I'm back at, um, I'm back uh, what I, what I, what I love and, and what I wanted to do. I said, well, wh what is it? She goes, I went to school to be a, a, a middle school teacher and I'm teaching middle school math right now. And I'm the happiest I've ever been. And uh, it's because of the conversation that we had. That would have never happened had we had a huge gray area again. She might still mm -hmm. be sitting. She's, I might still be sitting in that position right now. And so I think it's really important that we have clarity on this to make sure that we can take the skeptics and show them clearly how what they do makes a difference. But then it also helps the cynics to, to, for you to have that conversation. No, I, you know, clarity is a beautiful thing, right? And then you're helping drive. One of your cities. Right. It's one of your four C's. It's yes. one of my four C's. But, but it's grounded in convictions, which is my word for purpose. So yes. Um, yes. I want to I be mindful of the time. There's another concept. And I think that a lot of viewers and listeners will relate to this uh, in you know, kind of the environment that we find ourselves in. And, and I think just sort of what the future holds, which is this idea of agility and adversity. Agility in adversity. Can you start to unpack that a little bit for folks? Yes. Um, what we say is the companies that are going to win, and you can apply this to sports teams, you can apply this to any team. The ones that are going to win are the ones that make the most smart decisions the fastest. Say that most again. Smart, yeah. The most smart decisions the fastest. Mm hmm most smart, it's not two of these three things. It's over the long run, the most smart decisions, the fastest. And so what's happened is um, McKinsey put out a report that said when COVID hit in three months, it accelerated us five years into the future work. Yeah. And so what happened was we had an entire organizational framework set up for a certain number of decisions that needed to be made. And if your internal organization could make decisions faster than the external environment was changing, you're gonna be successful. Mm. Well, guess what? The external environment didn't just continue to increase, it step jumped forward, where now the organizational framework that we have, where there's hierarchy and there's structure and all the decisions need to go up the chain of command and they need to, need to come back down, all of that needs to be changed. And so that's, that's the stress that a lot of companies are under right now. And, and the highest levels of burnout are happening at the management layer. And it just makes sense because they're stuck in this old organizational framework where decisions need to go up and down the chain. But the pipe to take those decisions up and down the chain is only, is only built for 10 decisions a day. And, and it needs to make 50. Right. And so what you have to do is you have to make a shift. And the mindset shift that the leaders have to take is the most smart decisions the fastest isn't you at the top making every single decision. 
The most smart decisions, the fastest is everyone in the company being a leader and everyone in every layer making those great decisions. The key component of it is if you think of a hierarchy org chart, right? We got people on top of each other as you go up, their status, those lines in there represent, hey, the higher you up, higher, the higher up you are in that, the more control you have, the more decisions you make. That's what it's really based on. What you have to shift to now is more of a matrix framework. And think about a matrix where you got, you know, seven dots on the outside and you got lines going between each one of those. Those lines are not represented by control and command and control and decision making. Those lines are represented by trust. Those lines are represented by purpose, by values, by collaboration. And when you can establish that, then, then you can increase the agility and the adaptability of your company. And it, it, it takes time to do. If you're typically used to command and control, it might take you eight months, 12 months, yeah. 16 months to really shift this. But yeah. so um, th does that, does that yeah, hit the mark? Or no, very much, very much because I'm, I'm just relating it back to like your captain's yeah. orders. If I understand what the mission is and now something has changed, there's a variable that I wasn't anticipating, we'll call that adversity, but I understand what we're trying to do, then I've got the ability, particularly if it's been in an environment that is, what'd you say, push down responsibly, and you use the word responsibly twice, which I think is interesting. So, but, but if it's been pushed down responsibly, then it's like, I know what to do. I know that this is for a pacemaker. I know this isn't going to work for the pacemaker. I know that I can go make this adjustment. I don't need to ask Armando what to do and shut the machine down for two hours while Armando's away. And I, I, I know what to do and I can go do it now. That is a good, better decision faster than having to wait for. I love how you described too, the old model is, you know, allows for 10 decisions a day and now you need 50 decisions. Like the pipe just doesn't support the, the volume flow <laughs> trying to go through it. Um, and, and I just think it's really, really um, an important idea of seeding some of this hierarchical control, looking at it more matrixy, like you're describing, but it, it, and it's not chaos, it's just organized, act, you know, controlled activity. There's a lot more activity happening, but that's being done by more people more often so that it's not just all, sh you know, shunting up to one lady that's making the decision or one guy that's making the decision. Um, and, and we've talked about this before too, Mark. Today is the slowest day Right. for the rest of our lives it is right i mean it's sort of like moore's law applied yeah. to life today is the slowest yeah. day it's ever going to be and it just keeps accelerating and so if you don't have it built into the dna of your cultural model of how we're going to create the 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 skills to be able to execute in this environment then guaranteed your competition who is figuring this out is going to make more better decisions faster than you are and you're going to be in their wake yeah right yeah uh, I, I just thought i'd shared two tools that are very simple that people can use if you're wondering hey how do i start this journey Please. yes one of them one of them is any question that you get asked you have the same answer back for every every question you get asked so bob someone asks you hey should we go into asia and should we start setting up offices there or they say um hey should we sponsor this this speaking event every single answer that you have back to that person is is what do you think it's that simple and this has been shown to take even though you know the answer to it it's been shown to take something of a lecture which is five percent retention after 24 hours just asking that one question back and engaging the person it takes it up to 50 percent. that's by the national training and in, in bethel uh in maine okay. so so just a simple one question back and then you get to understand what it looks like. And, and say, for example, I said, hey, should we go with A and B? You would say to me, well, what do you think? And if I go like this, I go, A? <laughs> what, like, what, what, is that, what does that tell you? That tells you like, hey, he's not real confident in that. So the next question you would ask me is, what are the, what are the factors you took into account to say A? And if you know that there's four and I only know three, you would say, hey, those three are good. What if you added this one to the mix 
you wouldn't say that's why it's A. What you would say is adding that one to the mix, Mark, what do you think the decision is? And then I would say A. And then you would say, Mark, that's a great decision. Hmm. You're not making the decision. I made the decision. You give me a recognition for making that decision. And then the next time you might say, hey, Mark, when that comes up in the future, here's the boundary on it. If it's less than $5,000, you make that decision and you go on. The challenge that all leaders are having right now is we don't have enough people in our business. So there's this concept of time working in the business versus on the business. Yep. And more leaders are spending more time in the business. What you need to do that conversation, it would have been much easier for you just to say, Mark, it's A. But the next time that that comes up again, I won't know the reason behind it. What you need is you need time. So simple thing that you can do, cost nothing, just ask a question back, why? One, one other thing is your next decision is not your final decision. On the submarine force, we were encouraged to make a decision. If with the information that we had, we thought we were going to be above 40% correct. And if we waited till above 70%, we waited too long. Yeah. So how does it feel to make a decision when you're only 40% probability that you're going to be correct? It feels really uncomfortable. And that's the point of it with all the changing variables that are happening. And so um, the, the science behind this, and this is by the late General Colin Powell, the science behind this is we discount ourselves 30%. So when you're at 40%, you're actually at 70. When you're at 70, you're actually at 100. Ah. And so this is a really powerful tool that you can use in a group setting. And if, if the conversation, anybody in the group thinks that the conversation is above 40%, you just ask this question, are we above 40? Let's make the next step. It's not our final step. And then let's course correct it to success. In the submarine force, I made eight decisions in three minutes. The first seven were totally wrong. <laughs> but but what did those seven allowed me to get the eighth one right? And we had to be okay with that. Mm. So, so that's about 95% of decisions that are being made in a company today are those decisions. Now, if you're doing the load bearing calculations on a multifamily housing architect, you know, you can't go, hey, the design's 40% correct. I think it's okay. There are certain decisions that, that need to be made. So those two tools are super powerful if you want to start empowering and pushing decision making down. That is phenomenal. Well, I, I appreciate I, I always um, have a very strong bias for, so what do I do with this? What can I do now? How can I actually go implement something? So thank you so much for sharing two extremely practical and powerful things that, as we've said now for the third time, they're free. You can go do them right now and you'll see immediate impact. So that's awesome. So Mark, what are different ways that you engage with companies and how do people find you? Yeah, so we have, um, so leadwithpurpose.com is is the, the company that was started. The program's called Fast Attack Leadership. Um, so you can go to leadwithpurpose.com and um, also uh, professional speaking, uh, Mark Kohler speaks and um, out on the professional speaking circuit and, uh, and making it making a difference there. So, and then we'll, we'll, we'll share with you, Kim will share the, uh, my marketing director will share with you the, um, the URLs for the, for the so social media channels. That's awesome. So we could go for three more hours, no problem, because I know we have barely touched the surface on, on just a number of really, really important topics. But, you know, I would love to encourage listeners to get Mark's book, Lead With Purpose, you know, visit the website. Um, if you're looking for a keynote speaker for a company event or any type of a motivational uh, event, you can tell already Mark would be a wonderful, wonderful speaker for that. Mark, I've really just benefited so much, you know, in the not too long of time that we've known each other because there's just a, there's a depth. Yeah. There's yes. a depth to, to the principles that you're teaching people that, that are enduring, that work and, and that elevate the human spirit, you know, among, uh, I think above all things. And, and that is, you know, a very worthy mission that, that you guys have taken on. And I appreciate everything that you're doing, not just to make companies better, but to make people better. Oh, I, I appreciate that. That was one of the unexpected uh, benefits too, as people are taking this to the other areas of their life. And 
Um, I know that's what Career Club does too. So we, yes. we share that common bond. No, that's awesome. So thank you, Mark. Thank you everybody for listening. As Mark said, we'll have the uh, URLs available uh, in the video version of this and in the show notes as well. And we thank you again. If you're watching, please subscribe, like, comment on YouTube, and would love for you to subscribe, rate, and review on your favorite podcast platform. So with that, Mark, thank you very much. And I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you. I know you're gonna find it. You've got all.